glad you're in God's house. His word is before us. His praises have been sung. and We're drawn into him. I pray that is your experience. In John chapter 2, we're, we're introduced with this incredible picture and truth of what it means to, to not only follow Christ, but to obey our Lord. I don't know if you've noticed, but the concept of obedience is conveyed in many different ways uh, in our culture. Uh, sometimes uh, the idea of obedience is is framed very negatively, uh, where someone is surrendering or submitting uh, to the coercion of authority. In 1961, during his trial for heavy involvement in the Holocaust, uh, Adolf Eichmann made the comment that he was surprised so many people were upset with him because all he was doing was obeying orders. Obedience can be a very negatively framed thought, but more than that, obedience can be something that is very beautiful and very much a reflection of, of that which is right and that which is good. Uh, during uh, our nation's civil war, a northerner uh, traveled to a slave auction and purchased a slave. As the story has unfolded, uh, the, the one who bought the slave walked away with the young slave girl, and he looked at her and said, uh, young lady, you're free. And she said, do you mean I'm free to do whatever I would like? And he said, yes, you're free. And she asked again, do you mean I'm free to think what I would like to think? He said, yes, you're free. She said, do you mean that I am free to become whatever I would like to become? And he said, yep, that's it. You're free. And one last time she asked, do you mean I'm free to go wherever I would like to go? And he said, yes, you're free. And she said, then I choose to go with you. That picture of responding to someone who has given their life for us is the perfect, and I would say the only framework wherein we can truly understand obedience. So I want to welcome you to the Gospel of John as we continue our study, guided by the theme, real life. We have discovered who Christ truly is through these words, and we've even been encouraged to follow him recently in the Gospel of John. We heard the very words of John the Baptist, exciting and encouraging others to follow Jesus. But now we come to an incredible display of what it means to follow Jesus as we peer into the history that is being made in the lives of the first disciples. As chapter 2 opens, there are numbered five committed disciples to follow Jesus. That number obviously will grow moments after this story, but you see in chapter 2 that there is an encounter of something that looks very normal in their culture and ours, the celebration of a wedding. And when you look at this story, you understand that Jesus is attending because there are some familial connections with those hosting the wedding, and he has his disciples with him. What I find incredibly telling of this story is that once we read that the disciples were invited, they're not mentioned again to the very end of the story when we're told the disciples knew the glory of Christ. So as we look into this story, I, I begin to see that, that the story is absent of any interaction with the disciples except for the fact that they have been called to be observers because the dialogue opens between Jesus and his mother, between mother and the servants, between the servants and the master of the banquet, and then back to Jesus again. Not once are the disciples drawn in, so we see them pictured right after their commitment to say, Jesus, will follow you, they're pictured as observing this incredible story that has as its centerpiece obedience. Well, in a moment, you'll hear Jesus' own mother Mary saying, just do whatever he tells you. Now, I know there's some in the room that have said that to your preschool children. Have you not? You, uh, don't ask me to explain. Just do whatever I say. And that's not necessarily the spirit wherein Mary speaks these words, but she's encouraging and she's calling those servants to obey Jesus. And what I love about this is here are those initial disciples looking on at what happens when we obey the one who gave his life for us. 
or what happens to the one who has called us by his love to follow him. So I want to ask you to uh, take a moment, maybe take a break from all the other thoughts you've had of this past week or this coming week, and I'd like to ask you to posture yourself beside those five disciples as they viewed this story and entered a, a lesson of obedience like, like none that would, would come after. And I pray that you'll see within the very simple setting of this story uh, lessons for how you and I must have our obedience framed, uh, not negatively as if we're following the coercion of authority, but having our obedience framed by our desire to be and to follow the one we love. So this is a beautiful picture of what obedience can become in the life of those who say, hey, I'm ready to follow Jesus. I'd like to ask you to look at this story of obedience uh, through terms of questions. Because if I uh, postured myself beside the, the disciples, I would possibly uh, want to pause and, and look at the story then to the disciples and say, hey, did you catch that piece of the story? And perhaps a question would lead us better in to making certain that we've not missed any part of this incredible narrative that, again, resonates true life. Jesus is the only source of true life in real life. We're saying that again and again because it's true. And if we are to really understand and have his life uh, control him and, and change us, then we, we need to follow him. And if we're following him, well, then we need to obey him. Isn't that the unspoken term of following? If we want to know, are we really following Jesus, we need to ask the question, are we obeying Jesus? Are we glad in our hearts to say, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm interested in doing. So I want to share five questions with you. Let's go to the first question. We see this question reflected in, in the first three verses of John chapter 2. On the third day... There was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited, and when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said, they have no wine. Uh, pause for just a moment with this first question. Have we, uh, are we desperate for Jesus, even in those moments that are, seem to be routine. Are we desperate for Jesus in those daily routines of life, those matters of life? This is a very, very important question. Because I want you to notice something about this setting as we, uh, as we attempt to recognize whether or not we're desperate for Jesus, even in routine matters. I find myself being desperate for Jesus when the stakes are high. And there's something happening that I really can't discern, but, but I'm interested in your daily matters. That day-to-day -day journey wherein Paul referenced it as walking circumspectly in life. I want to know there, are you desperately needing Jesus? Do you recognize that you need him there as much as in the grand narratives of life. So with this first question, I want to ask you to consider the simplicity of the first three verses of this story. I like to capture this question under the heading of Christ in the commonplace. I want to show you just the commonplace nature of, of this story. God has reached down through Christ in his power to, to enter into the practical context of a very simple need. So let's unpack the practical context for just a moment. Well, the, the location first was very commonplace. We are told that the wedding is in Canaan. And if you're looking at a map of the ancient Holy Land, you'll see the Sea of Galilee in the northern part of, of the uh, area of Palestine. And then to the west of the Sea of Galilee, you'll see the town of Nazareth, uh, the hometown of Jesus. And then uh, just, just north, you'll see the town of Canaan. So you're looking at a proximity of where Jesus has referenced his hometown. But, so the, the location is rather commonplace. We're not speaking of Jerusalem or some other Roman stronghold. We're speaking of a very simple commonplace uh, location. 
But not only does that depict the practical context, there's also the, uh, the, common, uh, the common appearance of the people. There is a common gathering, if you will. Because of Jesus' close proximity, uh, having been from Nazareth and being close to Canaan, those that were gathered at this wedding feast were indeed possibly either uh, physical relatives of Joseph and Mary or uh, extended relatives to the point that perhaps Jesus even knew the betrothed couple or those that were hosting the gathering. We're not given those details, but I think geography can prove that there is some very common, familiar connections with this ceremony. So the practical context is location. The practical context is proven by those that must have been gathered uh, together. But I want you to look at how practical the need is. There's a common, uh, a very simple need as well. And the need is, uh, we're out of beverages. Now, I know that doesn't sound uh, like a, uh, a watermark moment in the miracle working of Christ. For here in our context, if somebody is without beverages, they're going to go buy more. But that's not the context we have here. There is within this context of the wedding and the absence of wine that unwritten Jewish law of hospitality that you simply did not allow your guest to be present without something that could be consumed as a beverage. And there were really only two choices. Uh, Dr. Pepper and Sprite was not on the scene at the time, so there was, there was water and there was wine. And the water can be trusted a lot of times, so when the wine is gone, the, the core substance of this gathering is gone. And we don't know much about ancient weddings in the Holy Land, but we do know that they lasted a very long time, possibly two weeks. So there's the need. This need comes to Christ. There is the practical, the commonplace context. But I want you to notice how this story opens on the third day. This is pretty exciting. When you read on the third day, you're reading that there is a sequence of days that have happened from, from verse 29 to verse 43, uh, verse 35 as well, where the next day is referenced, chronicling these days wherein the true identity of Christ is revealed. This story in Canaan, because of the opening the third day, equals to those revelations God had made known through the preaching of John the Baptist. And here in this common place, Jesus is about to reveal something significant of himself. So I want to ask you, do you recognize, even in commonplace moments, do you recognize your desperate need for Jesus, even in the routine matters of life? The great pastor and author of the 20th century, A.W. Tozer, writes this, and I love his statement, a belief, a belief that does not command every detail of one's life is not real belief. It is pseudo-faith. Pseudo meaning faith. So perhaps the difference between real faith and pseudo-faith is our resolve to trust Jesus with the details. And it says, Jesus, here, I'm desperate for you in this moment. When you and I are desperate for Jesus to move in our daily routines and details, we'll begin to lean toward a life of obeying him like we've not seen before. So Jesus has brought the question or the concern that we're out of wine. Now his response disturbs many at first glance. And his response opens our hearts to the second question we need to address as we consider what it looks like to be a life that has lived in obedience. The second question is this, how well do we know Jesus? I know that may seem like a simple question, but I want to ask you to consider this question in the framework of obedience and how knowing him in his fullness will certainly be all the motivation we need to obey him even in our daily matters. Now, notice something in verse 4. Mary said, hey, Jesus, I want you to know they've run out of wine. Jesus makes a response as he introduces this response with the Greek word gune, which actually means woman. And Jesus says, woman, what concern is that of mine? Now, I want to caution every person in here whose mother is living, do not address her as woman. That does not go well <laughs> in southern hospitality or any culture. This is not do what Jesus did with these words because they're really strongly contexted here. I had a teenager who wants to say, well, hey, can I not? Don't even go there. <laughs> no, you cannot. No, you cannot. But Jesus addresses his mother as woman because of this, a, a shift in understanding his identity. That's what's happening here. There is a tremendous shift. 
not in embracing his identity, but really understanding the fullness thereof. Uh, Mary had, at the apex of her thoughts, the familiarity of Jesus as her biological son. How do we know that was at the front of her thoughts? Because Jesus lovingly but firmly redirects her. At this point, Mary approaches Jesus from the context of the familiar. I would caution us to do that if we are desiring a life that truly obeys him. Approaching Jesus from the familiar. It might be that we're approaching him because we've heard his name and we've read the stories and we've studied the lines of Scripture to the point that he becomes that familiar tone of our faith. Perhaps even in that familiarity we lose the depth of who he truly is as God's son. And Jesus said to Mary, woman, what, what concern is this of mine? That may seem a bit disrespectful, but you have to remember. In John 19, Jesus said the same thing to Mary hanging from the cross. He basically said, woman, and then he pointed to John, the gospel writer, behold thy son. Even there, Jesus was leading his mother into a shift of identity of, of who her earthly support would be at that time. Here, he's leading her in a shift of identity of who he is as God's son. Woman, what does that have to do with me? And, and, and if that is where the statement ended, there would be many who would have trouble with understanding how respectful and endearing that statement was on the pages of Scripture. But Jesus follows it with, my time hasn't come. Oh, that just completely seals and conveys this depth of love Jesus had for his earthly mother because he wants her to know there's something larger at stake here when Jesus said, my time has not yet come. Jesus is indicating that the fullness of God's glory will be revealed through his life at the death, burial, and resurrection. And that's when the fullness of God's glory will be revealed. So it's at this moment Mary began to realize that Jesus is living in obedience to the perfect detailed plan of God. And Jesus must obey every part of that plan as it unfolds to the fullness of God's glory in the life of Christ. So Jesus is saying, Mary, I am obeying the Father's will. What a beautiful picture of a shift from seeing Jesus as familiar to seeing him as the fullness of God's glory. I would encourage you to move past the familiar. Because if you and I move past that which we've heard and that which we've had ringing in our ears all these years to a fresh expression of the glory of Christ, then... Oh, what obedience that nurtures within our hearts. It happened to Mary. She turns immediately after this and says, well, then do whatever he tells you. Because she knew in that line, my time has not yet come, that Jesus is pointing to the Father's directions. Oh, to obey Christ is to be plugged into Jesus, be in the fulfillment of God's will for, for all things and his will for your life. I love how Jesus termed this in John 15 Verse 9 and 10, when Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so I loved you. Therefore, as I have kept my Father's commands and abide in his love, I ask you to keep my commands and abide in my love. Do you see the translation of an experience with God, from God to the Son and from the Son to us, that as we follow and obey him, we are in line from that transition of the love pouring from God to the Son and through the Son to the world. If we will simply recognize Jesus as Ultimately, the expression of God's glory. We, we all know the importance of an immunization, do we not? This time of year, we know the importance of a flu shot, a vaccine that allows some of the disease in a dead form to be injected so that the body can respond and that outside agent have no effect on the body. I, I fear there is a correlation here that would make us rather uncomfortable. I fear at times we we have been inoculated with just enough of Jesus to be so familiar that perhaps we do not allow our life to be open to a fresh experience and understanding of who he is in even a deeper way. I fear sometimes we, we might see the verse or hear the word or, and we might think, well, yeah, that's Jesus and maybe our, our hearts are a bit more uh, impenetrable than they should be because, well, that's familiar. But all the the beauty of our hearts opening to say, Jesus, I want to know more of you. I want to know you even in ways I've not yet known you. So this is a wonderful question. How well do we know Jesus? So after this question, uh, we resolve. We, we turn back to the text and we come to verse 5 where Mary gives this exhortation to the servants of the wedding. 
based on what Jesus just said, hey, servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Do whatever he says. There's a third question we need to, to embrace if we want to see our lives as a life of one that is truly obeying him. And that question is this. I love this question. It's a bit uncomfortable for us. Are we prepared to trust him before we get the details? I'm asking. Are we prepared to trust him before we get the details? That's exactly what Mary is telling the servants to do. We don't know what he's going to do. We, we don't know if even the wine is that important to him because he just lovingly chasing my heart back to a deeper understanding of his identity. So all I can say is do exactly what he says. Well, that's not acquiescing. That is surrender at its most beautiful point. For the earthly mother of Mary to say, you know what, I have no directive over his authority. Just do whatever you say. My wife and I, I'm certain, could have done better in so many areas, but our desire has been in raising our two older girls, and now our youngest girl, is to teach them the most simple principle of discipleship. Just do what Jesus said. Do what he says. Obey him. Follow him. And if it doesn't look like what I would do when I follow him, don't worry about that. You just obey him in your life. Do exactly what he says. When Mary pointed the servants to this, I believe she was emphasizing two very, I think, very clear expressions of what it means to trust Jesus with the details. First, categorically, and second, conclusively. Categorically, there, at this point, there's no idea what Jesus is going to say. So it's as if Mary is saying to the servants, in whatever category his words are about to fall into your life, just obey them. You know, there are times Jesus speaks to our lives, and the category of his words might, might be our, our role as, as a father or a mom or a, a son or a daughter. Other times he may speak in the, the category he might be speaking to our hearts over with concern, our roles as a student or an employer, employee, whatever the case may be. There are other times he speaks and and he's given us instructions on, on a particular area of service that we have become involved in. And it's as if the servants are hearing these words for the first time in all of history. Whatever Jesus says, regardless of the category, do that. Every category wherein he speaks, follow him. And not only do I think the emphasis was, was categorically, but I think the emphasis was very conclusive. Meaning when Jesus speaks, that's, that's pretty much it. I, I can't tell you how many times... Uh, the corner of my mouth goes up in a smile when people will come and say, Pastor, I really don't know what to do. I believe Jesus has told me to do this, but I'm just really not sure what to do. And I'll smile and say, "Then I'm not going to top that. You go do what he says. So many times it's very tempting to uh, abort that conclusiveness because maybe we're a little afraid, a little fearful. But when Jesus speaks, may it be, we want to do this even before the details. I can't tell you how many times I stepped out on faith, and I didn't have any details. And I am a detail-driven monster. I'll tell you that right now. I want to know the map and what's going to happen, when, where, and how. And 99% of the time when I sense the voice of the Lord leading me, there are no details. They come, just like they come in this story. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go to verses 6 through 8. This is, this is phenomenal. In verses 6 through 8, this is what we read. So Jesus said to the servants, uh, fill up the water parts, pots. There were six stone water jars, uh, probably 30, 20 to 30 gallons apiece. Most would say the larger amount. And, uh, these were uh, pots where ceremonial cleansing was the purpose. Uh, in, in this day, especially in Hebrew custom, whatever you touched during a given daily pilgrimage, uh, that unclean thing would make you unclean. So anytime you entered any type of Jewish customary ceremony, you wanted to purify yourself with washing hands, and, and the, the water pots were there for that purpose. There must have been an incredibly large gathering to require that many pots and those many gallons of water. So Jesus goes and points at those pots, and he says this. We see the directive given in God's word. Uh, I want you to fill the water pots with water. Evidently, they'd already been used, or they were put to the side and were not needed for the moment, but Jesus said... I want you to fill each of those up to the brim, 30 plus gallons times six. Fill them up. And then he said this, I, I want you to draw some out and take it to the head waiter. 
take it to the host of the event. And this, this is what I find uh, really interesting. Jesus, as we know, could have just turned the water to wine and the story concludes there. But he involved. He's, he's saying to the servants, I want you to do this with me. And I don't know that any of the servants become his disciples. Maybe they do. But I believe with all my heart, he's saying, I want you to involve you because these five disciples are watching. They're about to do this up till their death. And they need to know what it looks like to obey without details and then to follow those details of Jesus and to see his miracles take place. So here's the fourth question. How much do we truly value Jesus, including us, in his work. How, how much do we value? Jesus saying, I want to include you. There's something I really want you to do. I, I wonder the value of that sometimes because often, I know in my own pilgrimage, we, we tend to default to, uh, to the drudgery and to the statement, I, I have to do this. I'm committed to do this. I've been enlisted to do this. I've signed up to do this. A lot of times, those institutional phrases can seem to squelch the joy and the value of Jesus involving us and saying, I, I could do this without you, but I choose to do this through you. I love the truths of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6 and following, where Paul makes this statement, we are not adequate in ourselves, but it is God who makes us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Is that not a phenomenal statement? We have no adequacy, but it's God that makes us adequate. Those servants had no cure, no response, no resolve for this problem. And I'm sure the disciples that were given the front seat view of this had no clue what would happen. And Jesus said, I want to involve you because where your pots are empty, I want to make them full. I believe with all my heart there's not one miracle that used an agent for that miracle where that agent was unimportant. If Jesus used mud or spittle, uh, it was to make a point. Jesus is using an empty jar, an empty ceremonial jar, so that it could be filled by his directives so that what is in the jar could be used for his glory. I wonder if at times when we come to Jesus that we don't come empty enough to say, Jesus, I want to be like that vessel you poured out at the wedding of Canaan. I want to be so empty that you can fill all of me to the brim. Make no mistake about it, Jesus didn't even have to say to the brim. He could have used a thimble to, to quench everyone's thirst. But he wanted, I believe, to ignite a passion within those who are following him that when I fill you, it's to the utmost overflowing so that I can do amazing things through you. If we do not resolve this question in our lives, we will never move from a volunteer to a minister on his behalf. Do we value Jesus including us in his work. And then there's a final question. Verses 9 through 11 allow this question to be sought after. Uh, see the conclusion of this story. Verse 9, when the head waiter tasted the water, well, you guys who know the story, you know what happened. He said, why are you giving us the best wine now? We've already run out of the other. This is the best. Isn't that amazing? Jesus says, I want to include you in my work, but not for mediocrity. I want to give my best. I want to present the best love, uh, the, be the best exhibit of love, the best exhibit of truth. I want to present myself in an incredible way, and I choose to use you. We should say goodbye to mediocrity just because of this one vision of this miracle. And the head waiter said, uh, why, why have you saved the best wine until now? And we move to verse 11, this miracle. This miracle is the beginning of signs and other miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and many other places to manifest his glory. Here's the final question. Do we truly understand, do we really understand that Jesus' way is far better than anything we could ever achieve or offer? I know this may seem like a simple question, but I hope you'll hear the, uh, the refrain of this story. Do we really understand that Jesus' way is far better than anything we could ever achieve or offer? Jesus touched the practical context of a basic need, and the wine was, was overflowing 
for the purpose of his glory being revealed to his disciples and to all others. Jesus being revealed in his glory is, is the goal of our lives of obedience. And when we obey as the servants did, when we obey as even the disciples will begin to obey, we'll understand following Jesus and responding to him as the true source of life is not done by lip service or, or by the routine of tradition. It's done when we say, Jesus, I get who you are, and I want to obey you. I don't just want to say I'm following you. I truly want to live a life of obedience. I love this uh, benediction from Ephesians chapter 3. I'll remind you of these words. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond what we could ever ask or think or imagine according to the power that is at work within us. To him be the glory. Where? In the church and in Jesus Christ. You are a part of the church. You have been called and redeemed. And if you have placed your faith in Jesus, he's calling you to follow him in obedience. And we ask that last question, do we understand that what Jesus leads us to is far better than what I could ever achieve or what I could ever hope or offer? And so we obey Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. So how is, uh, how's our life of obedience today? Do we feel that there is a coercion because we have, we've made the authority of Christ something that looks more like the authority of man? Or do we see Jesus for who he really is? And can we say, Jesus, you have freed me from my sin. I'm going with you. I'm, I'm following you. May we allow God's truth today to redefine what it means to follow Jesus. And if this is a this is a deep probing opportunity for the Lord. I just want to ask you to do this. Do what the five disciples did. Do what the servants did. Take on the posture of the empty pot and come to Jesus just like you are. Say, Jesus, here I am. I need you to fill me. I need you to use me. I want to obey you. May that be our prayer. Let's pray together.